Last night, Kyle Rittenhouse joined Tucker Carlson for an exclusive interview, where for the first time since he was acquitted of murder, he gave his side of the events on August 25th, 2020. In the interview, Rittenhouse maintained that race had nothing to do with the shooting and refuted claims he was a white supremacist. I'm not a racist person. I support the BLM movement. I support peacefully demonstrating. And I believe there needs to be change. I believe there's a lot of prosecutorial misconduct, not just in my case, but in other cases. And it's just amazing to see how how much a prosecutor can take advantage of somebody. Like, if they did this to me, imagine what they could have done to a person of color who doesn't maybe have the resources I do or is not widely publicized like my case. What did you make of the President of the United States calling you a white supremacist? Mr. President, if I could say one thing to you, I would urge you to go back and watch the trial and understand the facts before you make a statement. Rittenhouse also had some choice words for the media, whom he says defamed his character. The lies that they can just get away with spreading is just sickening, and it's a disgrace to this, to this country. I couldn't agree more. So before this, I mean, you're 17 years old, so you're probably not, you know, watching cable news all day or, you know, deeply into politics, or maybe you were, but did you know how dishonest media coverage of events could be? I, I didn't. I've never seen something so polarizing in my life when it's just, it's obvious self-defense. If you look at the case, you look at the facts, no matter what your opinion is or where you stand, this, isn't a this wasn't a political case. It, it shouldn't have been a political case. It was made a political case. This had nothing to do with race. And the, the ways people are twisting this, it's just sickening. In a recent piece for TK News, friend of the show Matt Taibbi writes, quote, it was reckless beyond belief for analysts to tell audiences Rittenhouse was a murderer when many, if not most of them, had a good idea he would be acquitted. He continues, when the population is on edge and people are amped and ready to lash out, that puts an even greater onus on media figures to get things right. Joining us now for his reaction to last night's interview and to expand on his article is journalist and co-host of the Useful Idiots podcast, Matt Taibbi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So I thought it was interesting, and it probably uh, infuriates some in the media, that Rittenhouse is going to use this uh, platform he has, maybe temporarily, maybe for a while, uh, to actually talk about some causes that I, I think are important and that a right-of-center audience could use to learn more about, prosecutorial misconduct, the tremendous power that the state has in criminal justice uh, matters to, you know, to, to punish, uh, to deprive people of their due process rights and people less fortunate than, than, than Kyle, which he, which he mentioned. Um, you know, what did you, uh, I, I found that admirable, frankly, frankly, that he was bringing those things up in this interview. What what'd you make of it? Yeah, as somebody who wrote, who's written two books on that subject, I thought that was really interesting that, uh, frankly, I bet there were parts of that interview that were probably deeply disappointing to the Tucker Carlson audience, um, which was interesting. Of course, one interview doesn't uh, tell you everything about a person, uh, but it was uh, it presented a very different image of Kyle Rittenhouse than we were led to um, believe for quite a long time. He even spoke in the language of... Um, sort of like upper uh, class white liberalism, you know, talking about people of color and that sort of thing, which is probably not what people expected when they when they got to meet this person. What were the parts you thought that were most disappointing to the Tucker Carlson audience? Obviously, that one that that we played there. But what were some others that you thought contrasted with what people would have of the their their image, their kind of wish casting of who Rittenhouse was? Well, saying that he supported Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. I think was a big one. Um, I think that pro probably there are people at Fox or, or who probably gulped hard when he said that, uh, but they put, they put that on and, and look, this is the problem with media and this is the problem with this case is that you can't caricature people based on a couple of cultural markers, which is what happened in this instance. We didn't know a whole lot about this person. We didn't hear from him directly from the very beginning. We knew that he carried a, an AR-15, which is something that we that most cosmopolitan liberals would never imagine themselves doing or their kids doing. So they made a lot of assumptions about him that, you know, that frankly did maybe didn't turn out to be correct, and that framed coverage for the entire year of this whole case. 
Well, and another thing that I don't know, it may, might have been disappointing. He didn't uh, in that clip. What you know, he's at, he's kind of teed up to really, really let Joe Biden have it, and uh, and he's and what and what he said is is, is fairly restrained, <laughs> given given what uh, you know what the administrate what figures in the administration, mainstream media figures, has said about him, and he was pretty he was pretty restrained in response. He was. I wonder if he's had legal counsel that might have uh, instructed him to to, yeah. to be a little bit restrained because. Right. And this is another thing. And I don't want to talk about Joe Biden specifically, but I think any experienced reporter can speak to this. One of the reasons that that I that the use of the term white supremacist was shocking in this case is that as a reporter, I would be afraid to use that word uh, about someone that I didn't have a pretty serious collection of evidence what had beliefs like that because I would be afraid of libel suits, frankly. Right. And the, 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 the widespread lack of fear of that, I think, was um, actually more instructive than anything that, that Kyle Rittenhouse said or anything, anything about this case. Uh, it was really it was something it was a sea change, I think, just in the way that we talk about people. Yeah, I mean, that's why you've seen a lot of media coverage of this now. Right. Instead of using that term to describe uh, Kyle, it's it's it, it, it's not a white supremacist. It's white supremacy is the this uh, kind of like amorphous spiritual illness that is that is that that is kind of surrounds this case and and informs what happened. Even if you can't point to any individual actual detail or evidence or or thing to tie that uh, to it. Right, and that's a little bit safer. It's a, it's a little bit closer to to the old practice of saying, well, he did this allegedly. You know, I mean, right. in other words, there are things you can do in journal when you're covering a story that um, that give you a little bit of uh, cover in, in avoiding the idea that you you've libeled somebody or defamed somebody. Still, uh, you know, they were just incredibly casual with use of, uses of the of the term uh, terms like racist. Uh, uh, white supremacist militia member. Um, they often implied that without saying it out loud. Like you know, it, it, it was stuff like that 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 I thought was troubling, just from the reporting point of view. Yeah, and and Matt, you and I, I think both had un unusual perspectives on this from having because both both of us have spent the last you know what 10, 20 years with spending so much time with defamation attorneys and with, <laughs> right, and with exactly. fact checkers, because when you do investigative journalism, it goes to the defamation attorney and it goes to the fact checker, and they go line by line. You know, what's, what's I've had my work poured over by defamation attorneys. I'm my first oh, book, I'm sure, and it's, and my first yeah. book, we read on the phone, you know, line by line for days and with you, an attorney you, to make sure right. that there's nothing that there's no liability for the publisher. And you do so much reporting about uh, you know conflicts like between two different people. Yeah, me too conflicts. Me, and th th those are like, those are defamation bait. They're yeah. minefields. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and so when you're walking through these minefields, you just learn kind of instinctually how to, how to be careful about what, what terms you use, how you phrase things. And to just see this stampede of the media just racing across the minefield, not worried at all that they're gonna step on any, like you, you step back, you're like, God, God watch out, you're, you're gonna have your legs blown off here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, exactly. Especially in the first days of the case. Remember that? I mean, that that was the thing. Like, and, and we all know this, having been in the business, the the initial blush of a story is when there's always some kind of error somewhere mm -hmm. built into the mm -hmm. to the first reaction to a story. And so you, you, what you really want to do, ideally, is kind of step back and wait for everything to shake loose till you you get the get the basic facts down. They didn't do that. They just they just rushed ahead with the caricatures um, because that's how we sell news these days. We're you know we're we're selling it to audiences uh, who want to hear X, Y, and Z rather than worrying about what exactly is right and how we get there. Yeah, I mean, the, because the audience had made up its mind uh, about this person. I think there was, uh, it, by, and by that I mean the audience of, of a mainstream or liberal publication, there's a tremendous pressure to then tell a story that fits that expectation, um, which, which produces bad journalism, <laughs> especially if it's allowed to go to, to this extreme. Well, right, and this is one of the points that I was trying to make, and I also heard uh, uh, David French make on Meet the Press. It's there are two different issues here. Do you do you approve of this conduct? We, as a parent, would you like your kid to go out with a, with an AR-15 to a danger zone? Um, that's one issue. Uh, do do you think that 
Uh, do you think that that's appropriate? Do you think that it should be so easy to get a gun in this country? The other issue is what actually happened in this case, and is he likely to be convicted? Is it murder illegally? Um, those are two different things. They mm -hmm. conflated them constantly uh, because anybody, you know, if you talk to any lawyer early in this case, they would tell you that according to Wisconsin law, it's it's pretty likely he's going to have a robust defense in this case. And instead, what they did is they raised the expectations of these of these audiences who wanted to hear that he was guilty because they didn't like him or what he did, which is a separate issue from what happened and what's what was likely to happen. What, what What's your sense of... Uh, the, uh, you know, the the fallout here in terms of the the law around stand your ground and and self defense it it feels like in some ways the the media's portrayal of this has made the situation dramatically worse in the sense that what they did is they convinced not just their own kind of liberal viewers but they convinced a lot of the country you know that that this guy was a quote unquote murderer and was guilty and so when he then gets acquitted. People who don't themselves kind of look into the details of the case will take the first piece of it and say, oh, so this guy just showed up and started shooting people, and then he got acquitted. That means I can just show up and start shooting people, right. and, and I can get acquitted. And right. say, well, wait a minute. But of course, with a country of hundreds of millions of people, not everybody's going to follow the snake all the way to its final conclusion. So, uh, you know, where, where do you think this leaves us kind of culturally? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it definitely creates an unhealthy uh, atmosphere for, for that reason, too. I, I didn't even think of that, but that's that that's absolutely right. Um, I was thinking more in terms of you know, you're, you're raising expectations that the person's going to be convicted and turns out to be acquitted. So you get frust fr frustration at the system, which actually probably performed correctly in, in this in this instance. It's the laws that you have a problem with. Uh, but you're right. Absolutely. There are, there are now people who, because of this faulty coverage, are going to come away with the impression that you, you can just show up anywhere at a, at a protest, and if somebody, if you feel threatened, um, you can start blasting away because that's how it was portrayed, uh, which is deeply irresponsible. I mean, it's crazy that, that people did that. Yeah. Matt Taibbi, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. More Rising right after this. Stick with us.